So welcome back, everyone. This is the second part of the Situation Room for today. Um, my second guest is TJ Murphy from the Real Q LGBT Film Festival from Pittsburgh. Hi, TJ. Welcome to the TED Hi, TV. Hi, thank you for having me here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, yes, so could you please introduce us um, your festival? Tell us a bit about the history of it and yeah, just how it all started. Yeah, absolutely. So Real Q um, began in 1985. Um, I actually think we're I, the sixth oldest um, queer film festival of our right. kind. Um, and we began um, as a collaboration between several organizations um, in Pittsburgh uh, to, you know, create a safe space um, to, you know, watch films that were at that time weren't accessible, um, you know, at all. Yeah. Um, you know, the the closest thing we had um, was maybe, you know, an art house theater in our downtown district that would maybe show one or two, mm. you know, queer oriented films throughout the year. Um, so from that, you know, we really built um, the festival into sort of what it is today with um, year round programming. You know, we're a registered nonprofit. Um, we give back to the community, you know, throughout the year in any ways that we can. Um, you know, we've really progressed, I think, just along from being a typical film festival, but more of a community event um, to bring people together. Yeah. So can you tell us a bit about this model of year-round programming? Um, how did you end up with this model? Because it's always interesting to, to see how festivals that run such a long uh, time, like Real Q, um, end up with, with, the, with the current model that you are working with. Yeah, absolutely. And even, um, you know, I've been with the festival personally myself um, as you know, started as a volunteer in, I think, 2012. And at that point, even we were just still in a, you know, 10 day, once a year festival model. So it's really only been in this last decade that we have, um, you know, adapted and expanded um, into the type of programming that we do now. So um, one of our, uh, you know, monthly series that we run yeah. um, is in collaboration um, with an uh, international but also local nonprofit called City of Asylum. Um, and so City of Asylum was really started to um, give space and voice to persecuted writers from countries where they were being oppressed. Right. Um, and the Pittsburgh City of Asylum model um, you know, wanted to create a physical space um, to bring people to see writers, to see music, to see art. Yeah. Um, so about seven years ago, we uh, started a series with them called Real Stories, um, uh -huh. which focuses on international uh, queer cinema, you know, with a focus on uh, countries where people are still predominantly heavily prejudiced against. Um, yeah. And so... You know, we started that out as a very fairly small series um, seven years ago. I think we did three or four um, films our first year in that series. And now we do it monthly. We provide yeah. it free for the community. Um, and it was our first, you know, sort of uh, virtual event we ever did, um, you know, in 2020, uh, I yeah. think, in sort of late spring. So, yeah. Yeah, we will we will get back, of course, to, to the... Um, to these online events and to how everything changed uh, with the pandemic. Um, but first, I would like to ask you, what is the main consideration uh, that you take into account when, when you guys assembling a program uh, for a given year? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think, you know, Pittsburgh is a very, uh, you know, interesting sort of diverse place. Um, and something that we always, you know, keep at the forefront of our minds while programming is not just to showcase the best, um, maybe of, you know, what we think is out there this year, but what we yeah. think might be most appropriate for our audiences. Sure. Um, you know, and that being said, uh, I think, you know, queer film festivals have such a unique, um, sort of... Uh, you know, 
battle when it comes to programming because not only um, are we a sort of like niche, uh, you know, group to begin with, yeah. but then we also, um, you know, are representative of, uh, you know, an incredibly diverse community of people from right. every walk of life. Um, so I think, you know, to, I guess, sort of answer your question, um, we do look at, you know, what is not only just the best coming out internationally, um, and, you know, locally within our community, but also what we think would be best representative of, um, you know, the audiences that we are aware of um, in our own community. Yeah. All right. So 2020, COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic, um, how did it change everything? Um, well, I mean, unfortunately, I think like what happened with a lot of festivals um, we had to, you know, outright cancel events um, in the beginning of 2020 that we had been working on for um, months. Uh, several years ago, we started a new um, smaller film festival, uh, the Pittsburgh Underground Queer Film Festival, or PUFF, yeah. as we like to call it. <laughs> um, and it, uh, we had to just outright cancel it. Um, in 2020, which was, um, you know, a big blow to us because we had already, um, I think we were about a month away from it um, actually happening. So we'd already begun marketing. Yeah. Um, so we sort of took a couple months off, I think there, like everybody did um, and sort of rebranded ourselves, um, you know, dived into that virtual world in a really big way um, in the spring and yeah. didn't look back. Um, and I think in some ways, you know, as much as we miss being in the theater and as much as I know our audiences miss, um, you know, parties and live Q and A's and talkbacks um, and that interaction that, that, festi that yeah. the festivals have, um, it's been great how accessible mm -hmm. um, we've yeah. been able to make our events. Um, yeah. And so, you know, and I think in some ways it's going to change the future of sort of how our events will look, um, even yeah. when we sort of go back to the new normal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, this is also something that um, many people from the industry point out that um, migrating at least parts of a festival online mm -hmm. uh, can really democratize um, um, these festivals because uh, the access is granted for a wider uh, audience. However, for instance, from, uh, from the point of view of uh, distributors, especially smaller distributors who deal uh, with uh, queer titles as well, they feel that um, that they are in a bit of a more difficult situation because um, in market events uh, they remain a bit more invisible than than their bigger competitors and in that way um, there is a block in the chain of uh, distribution of queer titles um, what is your sure. point on that um i mean yeah i think something that and i you know i can't speak maybe like on an international level with it but something that we have been running into um a lot here is the um which you know is sort of twofold is the fact that a lot of films get picked up very immediately before they really hit yeah. the festival circuit um by say netflix um you know hbo and they become widely available almost immediately, which, you know, is obviously an incredibly fantastic thing um, for the broader community, but, you know, for our film festivals and that, and sort of like the, you know, um, purpose of what we're trying to accomplish, um, it can be a real blow to sort of not, you know, have the chance to showcase these films um, throughout the year. And I, you know, Oh, and I know speaking um, with other festival organizers, um, you know, in America, that has been sort of an issue um, for a lot of us. And I know, especially for in 2020. Um, and I think something that I think everybody gets very nervous about is sort of what is 2020 going to look like in terms of um, content and production? Um, Certainly. Because you know, what are people, um, 
you know, everybody is so limited right now into what they're being able to create. Yeah. Um, that we really might get only get these like Hollywood movies um, in the next couple of years and the little yeah. productions will get left behind. Yeah. On the other hand, it can also spark uh, very creative ways of, of mm -hmm. telling uh, mm -hmm. stories with uh, very low budget or even no budget um, solutions. Um, and that could also be very exciting. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, now we are only in the beginning of 2021. So probably it's a bit uh, too early and it's a bit hard to say now. But what do you see? Um, how did the queer um, filmmaking community react to to this pandemic? Yeah, I can say, I mean, I do think it might, it is a little early, but I can tell you, you know, we opened our submissions um, in about mid-January and we've had um, clearly several, several films um, that were, filmed uh during the pandemic in really unique ways whether they are you know one setting apartment right. um stories or you know in a rural um say you know wood settings um away from people but there's been some really unique ways um i've you know we've seen so far of artists dealing with isolation yeah. Um, you know, with interpersonal relationships, especially with people that, you know, you may have had to um, quarantined with or been around. Um, so, you know, it, I think like, as you said, you know, I love that optimism as I think that this will be a really creative time for people um, moving forward, um, you know, and especially to sort of delve, I think, deeper into who people are and the stories that they want to tell. Um, because that's yeah. sort of what happened to all of us, um, you know, as we were in that isolation. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that probably very introspective works are about yeah. to come since it yes. was a time of, of very mm -hmm. intense introspection for for everyone. Um, yeah, tell us a bit about um, what kind of strategy do you have in place for the future for your festival? Did you think about how you're gonna approach 2021 and then further on? Um, and yeah, what what is in the cards for you now? Um, well, we're always looking to see how we can engage, uh, I think, with the community here um, in, a, in a, you know, the most meaningful way that we can. Um, and I think for a long time, um, you know, Real Q was sort of stuck and in its lane as just a film festival, um, when in many ways I think we represent more for, you know, and different things for different people. Um, so always moving forward, we're interested in seeing what it is that we can experiment with, um, you know, whether that's in terms of events or programming or, um, you know, the types of conversations um, that we're having with the community to engage with them. Um, so I think moving forward, you know, just a few years ago, we, um, you know, didn't have our Pittsburgh Underground Queer Film Festival, you know, we weren't doing sort of monthly events. And yeah. now we've really, you know, exploded into an organization um, that, you know, is incredibly consistent within our community. And so I think that's something that we're, you know, looking to see to always expand on, but not just expand, sort of, you know, hone in on um, what yeah. works for us, what doesn't, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's also an interesting question to consider, especially when we talk to a film festival that's running for so long and that's been through um, so much, um, that there is a very uh, obvious and tangible discrepancy in how queer film festivals across the globe are functioning. There are certain parts of the world where we have many different types of queer film festivals happening um, and there are other parts of the world where um, these festivals are facing generally a lot of struggle uh, to organize themselves. Um, what do you think uh, from your uh, perspective, how does the pandemic affect uh, this particular situation? 
I mean, I can't speak to the, you know, to the other festivals, but I would say that in some ways I would think, you know, uh, as I said, I, it's almost twofold because the pandemic allowed people to, uh, you know, sort of normalize sitting at home on your computer. Yeah. Um, and I think made that accessibility um, so much easier. And I know working with so many distributors here, um, you know, we were open to, you know, geo-blocking in different ways, which I think can be really interesting for other festivals as well. Right. Um, you know, for us, and just in, you know, in particular, we opened ourselves up to the state, um, which was really fantastic because we got people from, you know, six, seven hours away that would never have attended our festival in the past. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I think there, you know, there were good and there were positives and negatives um, to that kind of model. Uh, and I think that being said to also sort of speak on, you know, uh, these sort of like, you know, blackout zones of where the festivals aren't happening. Um, yeah. You know, I can once again, speaking for, um, you know, Real Q, I mean, the closest um, queer film festival we have to us is a couple hours away still. Um, and, you know, we very much are in a uh, geographical area where there is not much, um, you know, not only, you know, sort of saying queer film or art or media festivals happening, um, but, you know, there's not a lot of, it, of, of travel to those sorts of interpersonal travel to those areas yes. either. Um, so, you know, we're really lucky that we're sort of, we've been able to hold out for as long as we have here, you know, 36 years of putting this together um, and sort of being a consistent, um, you know, event for people, you know, not just in our area, but, you know, close by as well. So, yeah, that's, that's definitely very remarkable. Um, there is a very significant change right now in the United States in the yeah. politics and the political system mm -hmm. um how do you see how will this uh have an effect on uh queer storytelling queer film festivals and queer life in general in the united states um well i will tell you that i hope it autumn like very quickly starts starts to change funding um from our national endowment of the arts program um because i can tell you you know i think in 2017 the budget was cut um significantly um for the next several years um and so we're looking hoping to see a sort of immediate change of that um coming right. into 2021 um not just you know for arts organizations but also specifically for individual artists yeah. um and work that's being created uh, so we really hope that happens. And, uh, you know, I think sort of an interesting story, one of our first event this year, um, we had scheduled virtually for the day of the inauguration in January yeah. and had to um, cancel it, you know, sort of just because of the possibility of um, something going terribly wrong that day. Um, oh, wow, yeah. which I think sort of, you know, might give you an insight into, uh, what, uh, you know, I think the country was sort of feeling, um, yeah, maybe even just a month ago. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways, maybe, um, you know, that storm is starting to pass, hopefully. Yeah, let's let's hope that <laughs> yeah. that's indeed the case. So hopefully, yeah. Um, yeah, so... What uh, what can we expect, or what can your audiences uh, expect from from Real Q in the in the upcoming future, in the in the very near future? Yeah, um, I mean, you can definitely. We'll be doing um, you know a lot of virtual events. Um, we have a very like youth youth focused um, event coming up this spring. Uh, which we're really excited about doing um, because, you know, in some ways it can be really difficult uh, to sort of find content appropriate for queer um, teenagers uh, to showcase and, uh, you know, especially current and new. Um, but we have the opportunity to do um, some local, some show, so showcase some local uh, queer filmmaking that's happening, um, yeah. which is really great. Wonderful. Um, 
and uh, yeah, we'll have you know a lot of things coming up um, for June, and then we have our ten day festival uh, in October, um, which you know we'll see sort of what that's going to look like. We're not really talking about that yet, obviously. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah. a bit it's a bit up in the air as as everything yeah. else, but um, yeah, let's be hopeful. Let's be hopeful. Yeah. Yeah, Certainly. I mean, we'll be doing something. We just don't know where or how yet. And what for? So, yeah. yeah, sure. Great. Yeah. Uh, well, TJ, thank you very much for thank joining you. us today. It was very lovely talking to you. And yeah, thanks for thank sharing. You for having me to your what? Like, this studio is fantastic. I love it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's new yeah. for us as well. It was a... Um, it was an exciting experience to dive into this. Usually we do on-site interviews. Sure, yeah. So, yeah, but uh, yeah, it turned out lovely. I feel also very comfortable here. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And I, thank you know, you. I hope the festival is fantastic the next couple of days. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so we wish you all the best in the name yeah. of the entire Teddy Award as well. Uh, thank you once more. And um, yeah, good luck with, with the upcoming work. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Have Bye, TJ. Day.